We're live on YouTube now. Thanks, Jill. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Corporate Parenting Board. For those who don't know me, I am Councillor Chris Hobson. I am chair of this board. Can I remind all participants that we are meeting virtually? Therefore, proceedings may take slightly longer than normal, so your patience is appreciated. We live, we are live on YouTube, so please ensure you are mindful of this in your questions and comments. All questions to be directed through the chair, please. And we will now get on with the meeting. So the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Over to you, Susie, please. Thank you, Chair. We have apologies from Councillor Jeanette Walker, Councillor Mika Smiles, and we have a number of officer apologies from Rob Brown, Rebecca Scott, Chris Joins, and Celinda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, declarations of interest. Has anybody got any declar declarations of interest, please? See no hands up, so I'm assuming we haven't. So we'll go on to the minutes of the the board for the last meeting, which was the 30th of November. And can I ask if they were a true record? Anybody? Must be somebody that will agree the minutes for me, please. Agreed. Thank you. Can I have a seconder? I'll second that. Councillor Thank Halawi. Thank you, Councillor Halawi. Much appreciated. We we will now go on to item four, which is the COVID nineteen update from the Director of Children's Services, and this will be a verbal update. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll just give a quick rundown of where we are. Um, you will have known that Middlesbrough's infection rate last week was the highest in the country. However, it has come down since that time. Um, in terms of social care, um, there's not a significant effect on staffing in the frontline teams. So all children who are looked after, children subject to child protection plans and children in need are having their visits um, as they should be in our performance Although we haven't got our performance indicate uh, performance indicators for January as a whole yet, there's no um, there's no suggestion that those visits aren't happening. Um, the only area of staffing that is being affected at the moment is in our children's homes. However, you know they are um, managing to, they are continuing to manage to run the homes successfully. So I think we can be we should be being assured of that. Uh, we monitor the vacancy level on a um, on a twice I think it's three weekly, three times a week internally, so that we know if we've got to make arrangements to manage things differently. We also have to report figures to the Department of Education on a fortnightly basis. That's everyone. But if our staff absences should go over 20%, then we have to report directly to the Department of Education so that they can uh, they can um, they can support us or and certainly manage the the risk overall. There has been a suggestion that um, they might be able to offer us some money for agency workers, but as you'll know, um, agency workers are very hard to come by. So I'm not sure how much that would actually help us in the long run. In terms of schools, uh, schools have been more significantly hit. Um, no school has closed, I'd like to assure you, but there has been, you know, there has been some staffing issues. I would, uh, as I did at the improvement board yesterday, like to commend them, our, our teaching staff in schools. They really are going above and beyond and with passion to make sure that children are um, safe and being taught and getting the education that they deserve. Um, there has been a call also for teachers who are not actually teaching at the moment, not actually um, practicing teaching, as it were, or teachers who have retired to return to, to return to, um, as it were, the chalk face. Um, uh, the schools that I've spoken to, which I would admit isn't many, feel that that's not as useful as it could be because the staff don't know the ways of the school and the curriculums and and the, and the children. So I think that teachers, are, the schools, the head teachers are continuing to manage by, for example, getting some of their um, teaching assistants to hold classes using the halls, those sorts of things. Um, 
So I think that's really it in terms of what well, I can give you an update in terms of the services that we're, um, you know, the services, education and partnerships and social care are, um, are doing to manage our way through COVID at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. So um, questions I will take now. I can see Councillor Davidson, you've got your hand up. Yeah, it was just really a comment I wanted to make, Sue. Are we contacting the schools with regards to parents wearing masks while they pick the children up? I, I did the school run myself last week and was absolutely in shock because I was the only one with a mask on in the playground. But I do believe it's been requested that they do wear them now. But are we and asking schools to do this for the protection of our children? I don't think we can we can't actually ask we we can ask we can't actually mandate it um but I know it's a recommendation I just seen Trevor's on the call Trevor have you got any particular comment to make around how we're managing that situation or how we're trying to influence that situation Yes I think that's that's exactly right Sue we're, we're trying to influence it rather than um enforce it because we we're not able to do that so at all of our um regular meetings that we have with head teachers and, and school leaders. We discuss all of the, uh, the COVID related precautions um, and approaches. What mask wearing being being one of them. Um, and we have done all that we can to make sure that that head teachers and school leaders are, are enforcing that, but they are telling us that it is really difficult. It's really, really problematic because some parents and carers uh, are essentially are, are are refusing so so it it is difficult but we as a council are doing what we can to persuade and support our colleagues in school to to enforce the regulations just one addition chair oh sorry i do apologize no that's Thank you. fine go ahead so um, just one thing that I should have said earlier, we do have a system in place. So when vulnerable children are not in school, uh, social workers are notified. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just Thank to echo you. that really, Sue, which is Graham from public health. Uh, uh, just to echo that again, what, what yourself and Trevor were saying, we from a, from an outbreak infection control point of view, we've been, um, we've been advising them when they, when they ring in with cases for schools and been advising them obviously to, to make sure that they've got preventative measures in there, but it's a challenge for the schools to be able to sort of police and implement that as well, especially when it's outdoors. A lot of the time, some of the settings they're coming into and the busy areas. So it's just, it's just quite a challenge. I think schools are aware of the challenge and trying to deal with it. It's just, it's, it is that it's, it's a bit of a challenge because there's no mandated powers as, as, as such for us to be able to do anything and support the schools. <clears throat> yes, Councillor Davis. Can I just add to that, Chair, please? Yep. Um, are the numbers in schools actually going up? Because I've I've heard all sorts of um rumours about that they are. Is is that correct? The COVID cases in schools itself. The the rate the rates have slightly increased over the over the uh over the last few days in terms of the cases we're seeing reported through the schools. Um, historically, over the last couple of weeks, it's generally been um, the stuff where we've seen quite a high number of absence at the moment because of um, the COVID rates have been really in the age bracket of sort of 19 to 59, which is our working age population. So we've tended to see a lot of the um, tend to see a lot of the schools st struggling with staffing as opposed to, to pupils getting into school. But we are seeing a bit of a we, we, we did see a bit of a knock on effect with with, with more infection rates in school children. But rates per se are beginning to plateau off a little bit now. Um, so hopefully um, things shouldn't be too steep in terms of the, the impact it's having on our children um, in school. Thank you. That answers your question, Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would just like to re reiterate what Councillor Davison has said. I live next door to a school. And yesterday, I think I counted three masks of people that were going in. Uh, Every one of them was on an elderly person, uh, obviously a grandma, granddad that was picking the child up. Um, it seems to me, and I know you're saying that there's nothing much we can do, and I agree with that. The head teachers need to come on board with this, but it seems to me that it's um, there's so many people not wearing masks that it, it's quite worrying. So. I don't know whether we can reiterate that to the schools again, please. Right, 
Well, now, sorry, so, Chair, yeah, just yeah. to say, Chair, sorry, am I butting in again? I do apologise. No, no. You, I've got a meeting. Um, I have a, a sort of um, occasional meeting with head teachers tomorrow. Um, that's like a DCS head teachers meeting. I can certainly uh, mention it at that meeting if that would be helpful. Yes, please. Thank you. Right. Any more questions? Oh, yes, Carl. I was just wondering, I know we just talked there about parents, um, but I was just wondering what the take up was in in staffing schools or staff generally in terms of the vaccination take up. Um, and obviously we know the vaccination take up in central and as and is low, but I wondered how that how that was in, in terms of school staff um, uh, as opposed to you know necessarily parents, because uh, they don't necessarily have to uh, um, have to be vaccinated, do they? I think Graham's probably best place to answer that in terms of because my um, I don't have a, a full enough understanding, but I don't think we, we can't mandate it. We can ask people if they've been vaccinated, but Graham, yeah. perhaps you'd update me on that. Thanks, Sue. Um, I can't, it's really I can't really update in terms of we don't have the full picture in terms of schools and vaccination rates for their for their. Um, teaching staff, I know we've had some feedback from schools when I was at. Um, some of the heads meetings uh, in the last couple of weeks that they are a little bit concerned that they've got a f the schools that do have a couple of members of staff that are unvaccinated because it does pose a potential ri more of a risk in the school environment in terms of obviously outbreak and infection control but there's not a great deal that they can do in terms of that that what what does support them a little bit the schools is that the isolation periods are obviously longer um, for people that are unvaccinated, so when people when they do have cases, obviously there's more of a chance of keeping the infection con the the infection outbreak rate down um, if the members of staff are off school while they're infectious. But in general, going back to your question, there um, we don't really know in terms of the picture in terms of our unvaccinated population for our school teachers. So sorry, can I just come back? So so could we do? Um... What, what, what in, in current terms is, is a Morrison's and um, and um, pay staff just standard sick pay rather than uh, to, to try and force their arm? Yes, so do you want to answer that? Um, well, Trevor might be best place, but my um, um, my view is that we can't in terms of um, in terms of academies, um, mandate or Morrison anything, and we can still only our head teachers that you know our teachers have sort of maintained schools. It's not something we can do. Um, uh, we would be able to advise them, as I've said before, but um, that's not within our gift. Schools are run by governors. Academies are um, ac academies run themselves. It's not something we could do. That, yeah, that just just to echo that. So that that that's right. I maintained our academy. The teachers' conditions are governed by the school teachers' pay and conditions legislation, and um, at at a local level, we can't influence that at all. So, I, meant, I saw Tony Parkinson come in. Are you still there, Tony? Do you want to come in on that? No, it's okay. So, and Trevor have made the points I was going to make, Chair. All right, thank you. Right, somebody else wanted to come in there. It was me, Tia. Um, All right, thanks to you. I was just thinking, could we ask some of our young people what impact it's causing um, the teachers being off longer, or maybe just writing like the impacts of like them not having the vaccination is impacting the ch child's learning, or like just to say like this is the impact that's happening um, with you with the COVID that you're staying off longer, and maybe to just I don't know have the boy child of the voice of the child to say like this this is how I feel when I can't go to school or it could maybe convince them to get the double vaccinations. I think Tia if we go back to this meeting which is corporate parenting which is about our children I think that there's something you know maybe um, the virtual school could help with this or maybe social workers could ask if there is something that we could that you know young people could do we've also got the children in care meetings and the care leavers forum and the mini children in care council meetings starting again face to face 
So I think that, you know, without taking it out to all pupils, which I think would be a massive task, um, but maybe I could mention it at the head teachers meeting tomorrow. Maybe that's something they could think about themselves. I think the problem is, though, um, I think even if those staff were vaccinated, there's still a shortage and I'm not sure how much that would that would alleviate the shortage. But I think maybe in terms of our looked after children, maybe there's a discussion to have there. And I think you're involved with those meetings, aren't you, Tia? Um, at, at the moment, I'm not, but I'm, I've been asked to join. But I am going to be carrying on my apprenticeship for virtual school. So I'd be able to get a bit more involved in that. Have a chat with Victoria then and see where you get to with that one. I think it's definitely the voice of the child should be heard throughout whatever we do. So I think it's absolutely right that you remind us of that. And I think as corporate parents, and you know, we are in a different position than we, but well, I think we're in a different position than we are with, you know, um, children across the borough. So good to have a chat about that, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? I see any hand, oh yes. Councillor Udin. Yes, sorry, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Nuria. Uh, Raise your hand for a while, actually. Yeah. Oh, um, the uh, only you. simple question I just wanted to check. You know, uh, the back of the question of um, Councillor Davison asked, you know, about the masks. Is this the, uh, I mean, with the, I don't know who can answer this, you know, whether it's Sue or Trevor or Graham. Is it the parents or the children not wearing or refusing to wear masks? Or if they are, are they giving any reason why? Yes, so if you want to answer this. Um, I can, I'll start and Trevor will prompt me if um, um, it would be for the schools to ask the parents why they're not um, wearing a mask. And I think challenging a parent is always quite a, a challenging thing to do. So, um, so I, I don't think it's information that we would or could have. We might get a general idea by asking a school who might say it's because there's a certain maybe cohort of parents who've chosen not to, or maybe we, they know that some parents may be, for example, asthmatic or have panic attacks. But I think in terms of the more global question that you're answering, we don't, we would not have that information. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. Trevor, have yes, I got uh, that right? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I, I, I was just going to add that in, um, in, in virtually all cases, uh, we're talking about, or I think we're talking about outdoors situations here. Um, once parents or carers move in school, then then the school is able to enforce the, the regulations appropriately. Certainly I was at Stainsbury Nursery la last week and uh, all the staff were, were um, masked when they came into to, uh, contact with me. Um, so, so I think certainly um, indoors, it's, it, it's easier for the school uh, to enforce regulations, harder outdoors when the the parent might be um, in the street or in the uh, in the playground because it's they perceive it as a as a um, open air space. Okay, thank you. Right, any further questions, Councillor Cooper? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I think half of the problem here is we don't know what the current rules are because it keeps changing. And when we see our politicians on the telly, they don't seem to know themselves. Can we make sure that parents and young people who are old enough to understand know what the rules are? Thank you, Chair. Maybe you could take that up with the head teachers then, so please. I'm sure that we said, well, we will have a conversation about COVID. I'm absolutely certain of that. So I will raise, we do get information from the Department of Education on an almost daily basis, updating us. And I know that schools will get that information as well. So the current information um, goes out there, but also a grand public health also uh, make sure that information gets to schools. I don't know to the wider public. I suspect that's more like looking more about looking on the um, public facing websites, but you might be able to advise me further. Yes, so we, uh, we do send regular communications out um, in conjunction with um, obviously education as well to the schools um, 
generally um, they form the basis of we, we've recently sent out correspondence which is called the one inform letters so they would be the letters which the schools would use to send out to parents which would inform them of um, cases in the classroom and any actions that they would need to take up um, as a parent um, likewise if there's any changes in guidance we do we do keep abreast of those and keep schools updated with those um, sometimes just with the nature of the way that guidance gets out, schools can find out before us. Sometimes these days, it's just, just the way that obviously things are distributed through the media and, and, and fall on people's laps sometimes a lot quicker than we get them out sometimes. But we always we always get them out to schools as soon as we as soon as we've got the new change any new changes in guidance. For example, isolation periods um have recently changed. Um we got those out to schools immediately as soon as we know about them. So we all the comms we generally get out to schools as soon as we can. Um, and they, in turn, will get them to parents when they can. Thank you. Yeah, answer your question, Councillor Cooper. In a roundabout way, Chair, yeah. So I'm assuming from that, that parents and children have to wear masks going to school. Is that right? It depends really in terms of, I suppose, in terms of the guidance, where it'll be, where it sits is, um, like Trevor said, if it was indoors, they'd be mandated to wear a mask. Um, outdoors, outside of a school environment, they wouldn't be mandated to wear a mask because it's not on a school premise, premises. But a school can ask a parent to wear a mask when they're dropping the child off if it's within the school premises, but outdoor. So they can ask it, but it's very difficult to police because you can imagine there's a lot of footfall, um, a lot of children, a lot of children. Um, around a lot of parents around as well. So schools, school by schools will be asking um, parents to wear masks to drop their children off when they come on school premises. However, being able to um, sort of keep track of that and police that is very difficult task for schools. Um, schools. Some schools may have asked for it. Some schools may not have asked for it. I'd hazard a guess that all schools will probably have asked the parents to wear a mask while dropping off at school um, at this point in time while infections are high, um, but it's just, Obviously, police and that's a very difficult and different situation from being able to um, being able to because it's not mandated. Does that help? Does that help in terms of answering that there? Hopefully. Yeah, I think really it's a case of winning hearts and minds, isn't it? If we can convince the little ones, they'll take care of the parents themselves. Thank you. Right. Any further comments or questions? Right, we'll move on to the next item, item five. That's children in care in Middlesbrough. And this is the role of the CCG and the designated children in care team. And I'm going over to Nikki Ayres or Kelly Dudding. I don't know which one's going to do the presentation. Hello, Councillor Chair. Thank you very much. It's Nikki Ayres here. I'm from the CCG. Um, I do apologise for the late getting in. I had my WebEx issues, it's a system I'm not used to on my, on my thing, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I've been asked to do a, a kind of a brief on uh, the designated team within the CCG, uh, how they support the children in care across the health um, landscape. And Kelly Dudding, who's on, also on the call, is a colleague um, within the health services provider um, who will actually look at um, the uh, provision of the review health assessments. Uh, there was a, a query, I think, in the past around how data is collected and how health have their data uh, uh, is slightly different to how it's collected within the local authority. Um, so I thought it was good to give um, to share a brief um, of what our role and, and expectation is around the data. Um, and then Kelly was going to kindly share um, a slide um, that hopefully will dovetail quite nicely with my um, small report that I sent. Um, I don't know whether anybody's had a chance. I do apologise as well. When I looked at it again with Susie, um, there was a small part of the report missing, but I can talk through that if um, Susie's happy to share that part of the slide, uh, that part of the report. Um, so I was going to give a brief overview, unless there's any questions straight away. Do I'm happy to go with however you wish this to, to be done, no, Chair. We'll I'm do a brief overview. Yeah, we'll do questions after you've done your report, Nikki, please. OK, no worries at all. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, in my report, um, I mentioned just really about the designated professional role and the role of the CCG um, for children in care. The fact that this role that I'm in, I'm currently in an interim role, um, but they are statutory roles within the um, clinical commissioning group, the CCG. So as part of the NHS contract, 
um, the CCGs have to have designated professional safeguarding team, which the children in care is one of them. Um, and there uh, should be a doctor as well. Um, and then there are various aspects that we are, um, are, are part of our role that we are expected to do. Um, and that's mainly to support the commissioners in commissioning of services for children in care, attending obviously corporate parenting boards uh, like I'm doing today, um, and also uh, have an expert level of children in care background uh, around their health in particular, but a, a wider aspect than that, um, in order to inform, support and advise colleagues on aspects of children in care, particularly their health. Uh, one of those um, is obviously around the um, health assessments when children come into care um, and the fact that the initial health assessment um, has a tight time scale um, in order for the children to be seen um, and we support our paediatric colleagues in the acute trust uh, as well as Kelly and her team to kind of um, unstick some of the issues that might arise if there's delays in getting these within the time scales. Um, also we advise other colleagues um, regionally, nationally and locally around all aspects of of kind of children in care, and that's policy change, um, uh, and also just general kind of advice and guidance. We supervise some of our children in care colleagues as well in the in the key providers, and um, just really to keep them up to speed um, with current cases, to also to keep them up to speed with their own competency in order for them to fulfil the role. Um, so that's really a brief overview of, of kind of this role. I did include in the report the, um, if you like, we call it our little Bible. It's our um, competency document that all levels of children in care nurses and health professionals have to work to. Um, and that's reviewed um, within our appraisals every year that we're meeting those um, uh, competencies in order for us to fill the role, fulfill the role correctly. Um, and if there are any gaps, obviously we work together with our um, line managers to ensure that those gaps are filled as best we can. Um, what we're always finding, particularly around the training and keeping our competencies up, is that a lot of the national conferences for level four or five um, that we need are very expensive and also usually very infrequent. But we do actually have other, other ways now within the competency guidance that we can meet that need. So that's that's supported us in our role. Um, so that's uh, really about the role itself. And then going on to how we support the initial health assessments and the review health assessments within the CCG, as I'm sure you know, they commission services across TEAS, one of which is um, the initial health assessments, and they are have to be undertaken by a medical practitioner. In TEAS Valley, that is the paediatricians uh, within the acute trusts, um, and they have a very tight timescale with, with which to undertake the, the um, medical for that for that child when they come into care. Um, again, I've included the document, the promoting health and well-being of uh, looked after children, um, in the embedded it in the document because that is, uh, if you like, again our bible at the moment around health. It's, although it's 2015, it's still very relevant around the expectation of what you should look at within an assessment, what should be offered for the child. So I thought that was quite useful um, to put that in there. And if you've had a chance to look at that and have any questions, feel free to let me know. And then within that, uh, within the report, I then put just really in practice, in practicality, what should happen uh, with regards to when a child comes in care, how their health assessments are supported um, and what issues and roles certainly recently we've come across. Um, and the main issue at the moment is really capacity um, across all health services for these children to be seen uh, uh, particularly initial health assessments, although they are contracted, the paediatricians are contracted to provide that service. So we have to work together to ensure that the clinics are offered very regularly. Um, and I, I meet with local authority colleagues um, if there are any issues where we need to unstick some of these bottlenecks, if you like, for want of a better phrase. Um, but on the whole, um, the compliance is set in contract at 100 percent, which you can have to be seen in a timely manner. And I have to say, even with the COVID impact um, and also the other pressures around, obviously, the staff having COVID themselves and being off sick um, and sickness levels, they've actually been able to maintain a, a really um, high level of compliance. We've dropped probably around to about 98% in one month, for the compliant, the IHAs. So that's really through the hard work and the flexibility, both of the, the carer, the child, the paediatrician and the admin to actually get that 
um, and, and the social work to actually get that um, put in. So we're, we're doing relatively well um, from that point of view. Um, and then obviously Kelly can pick up on the review health assessments. Um, and at the end of the revised report that I did send uh, back to Susie, I put what we call our quality indicators. So that's what contractually we ask our colleagues um, to work to and to provide under, under health assessments. I think it's fair to say that um, there's some revision to those that have been required because it's not just about doing a health assessment, seeing what their needs are, referring that child. The quality behind that is really about um, reviewing if the child has had the referral um, uh, action, reviewing if they have had the dentist, they've been able to get um, to see a dentist, refer, um, making sure they've been registered with the GP. Um, if we have what we call complex referrals, it's really making sure that the nurses within the health team are following up on those referrals in a timely manner so that there's not, say if you're a child, particularly if you're over five, they have an annual review, they're not waiting until the next review to be told uh, or, or the carer to tell the um, children's nurse that they've not had heard anything from the referral that they were expecting. So going forward, we have um, within the CCG um, procured a new um, review health assessment service um, that's been led by the views of the children. Um, uh, we had some quite excellent engagement sessions um, and listened to what they wanted um, from this new service. And the biggest thing, quite rightly, was single point of access. They wanted to know who their nurse was. They wanted consistency with their nursing um, uh, colleagues and partners. And what else could it offer them? So from April, fingers crossed, we will have a new review health assessment service which covers all of Tees Valley um, and the, the um, best of the communications are going out kind of literally as we speak on that one. So I think we've had a drop in compliance around review health assessments mainly due to capacity again but I think from that point of view having this review health assessment single point of access for coordination and delivery of the service one hopes over time we'll see a very consistent application, a very consistent access um, for these children and their carers and the social work colleagues into the service. So that's really a whistle stop tour of what a designated nurse um, for children in care can do. Um, and obviously I work, certainly work with Kelly um, and her team around the RHAs. South Tees Hospital um, also coordinates some of the children in care work and they are excellent at highlighting to me um, where there are, are gaps in service, particularly around health, that referral may not have been picked up, the GP may not have been responded to a request in time, um, and I tend to pick up the phone then to these people, talk them through the process. So a lot of it is them not understanding what's expected for a child in care, and a lot of it is statutory, um, a lot of timescales that we need to work to for them and with them to support them to get what they need. Um, and actually then I think um, what Kelly will share one hope can see the difference between what social care have to collect for children in care and the health assessments and what we're contracted um, to support and offer them as well. So um, I hope that gives you a bit of a flavour around uh, what we do and how we support it. I'm more than happy to take any questions or would you like to see Kelly's slide and, and discussion first and then we take the whole. No, I you know, think we'll, we'll take that. questions for you first, Nikki. And okay, then we'll same for Kelly. Yeah, no worries. So, has anybody got any questions for Nikki, please? I think you're getting off quite lightly here. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've, I've either, either stunned them with silence or yeah. hopefully the report um, just, kind of said it all, but I'm more than happy if people think of anything afterwards, feel free to share. Well, with I, I'll just make a comment. Is one My comment is that I'm pleased that the children are getting involved to make sure that mm. they're getting the right um, Absolutely. service well, we had... and I, I, that, that really pleases me that the children are getting involved and people are listening to the children. The engagement sessions were excellent. They were, you know, they were they were well supported. They were well attended. I think the coordination of those was good as well. Um, and we genuinely, not just me, but the the whole procurement team and myself and the colleagues that were part of that, genuinely did listen to what they really wanted to make the service work. Right, that's excellent. Right, Carl, would you like to ask a question? Just because nobody else is answering asking questions, I'll ask one. Um, on the on the table at the end uh, where yes. you were showing your um, indicators, the final one. I mean, you just you just drawn to the target where it says twenty percent to quality issue. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Can you just explain around that, please? Yes, yeah, sure. So these are this is um, a, a, if you like a, a national set target. Um, uh, in the twenty percent really reflects that we have limited um, out of area children coming into area, but also out of area. Um, you can set it as high or as low as you you wish, but the data we looked at in the past, which is numbers that we've supported, um, reviewing dip something if you like twenty percent of the out of area children that we've either placed out of area or come into area that we do on behalf of another CCG, we've been, um, have been shown to twenty percent dip something was given as a good overview of the quality basically. So we didn't want to kind of change any parameters too much. Um, and we've gone really with a regional and a national target. It's anything from 10 to 25 percent. And we kind of felt because there's relatively no numbers and people were happy to do um, dip samples, you know, up to 25 percent, uh, 20 percent. It was a good figure to leave in. Thank you. Any further? All right. So. Uh, just a comment, Chair. Um, Nikki, please um, um, nudge me if I'm getting this wrong. You, as, um, as looked after children um, a nurse service, you're responsible for children placed by other authorities in Middlesbrough, as well as Middlesbrough children. So it's a it's a different cohort as well. Um, I don't know how how different, but there will be children that you work with that aren't Middlesbrough looked after children. Correct. That's right, Sue. So, from the point of view of uh, if a child is placed into our area, into Middlesbrough, from another CCG and local authority, it's their duty to inform us that they are placed um, in the area. But actually, the responsibility, although we would oversee if there was an issue around health or quality or referral, we link closely with our CCG colleague in the from the um, placing local authority that placed them into Middlesbrough. And that would be the same as well. We would want to know if their Middlesbrough child was placed out of area, so that again we could link with the appropriate um, local authority and CCG if there are any issues around, particularly their health assessments or or any delays in referrals, etc. Thank you. I just thought it was relevant for um, councillors to know that. That's a very good point, so because I didn't know that, so that is a very good point. Thank you. All right. Any any further questions before we go over to Kelly? I don't see anybody, so we'll go over to Kelly if you'd like to do your presentation. Kelly, please. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit um, first and foremost about where my role came from, if that's okay. So, um, we, I work for Harrogate and District Foundation Trust, and we are the provider of review health assessments. So, South Cheese is um, commissioned to undertake the coordination um, of the health assessments, but as as a health provider, we provide um, the review health assessments for our children in care. And historically, um, the name nurse for child protection always kind of overseen the, the children in care aspect. But on the back of the intercollegiate document that came out in December of um, 2020, the um, HDFT actually submitted a business case in respect of um, secure and funding for a whole time name nurse children in care um, just to kind of meet the standards, standards for the intercollegiate document. Um, and this is where my post has came from. Currently, I am um, name nurse for children in care across the north of HDFT contracts. So I go all the way down from, well, anywhere up over from North Yorkshire, all the way up to Northumberland. Um, so you can imagine trying to get your head around the different um, providers and who's responsible for what in terms of a very um, complex health economy takes me some doing. So um, I'm not surprised that sometimes partners get a little bit confused about who's responsible for what. Um, but just in terms of our children in Middlesbrough, we are responsible for completing the review health assessments um, on our children in care based in Middlesbrough. And I just want to share, share with you um, just a little bit of data in terms of, if I can find it, in terms of what we kind of look at. So if you look at this slide, what we have um, is for quarter two, because we're still waiting for, oh, 
a lot of math. <laughs> It's been not my friend today, um, technology, I'm struggling with it. So we haven't got quarter three data as yet, but I've kind of looked at the quarter two data and pulled what was requested, what was completed within time scales and what wasn't completed and did a little bit of mitigation around that. So across quarter two, um, and I've split them down into naught to six and six to 19, and that just kind of demonstrates who's responsible for, for what in HDFT. So for the naught to six population, it will be our health visiting service. Um, and those children who are um, under five would get a review health assessment every six months. To six to nineteen, it would be our um, our school nurses, and that would be an annual review health assessment. Um, and this just demonstrates our compliance with that. So we had eighty four percent completed within time scale, ten percent were late, and six percent weren't completed. And you can see underneath that some of the mitigation was um, the 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 patient didn't want that RHA completing. Um, Two of them, there was no mitigation. Uh, one was recorded as being late, but actually, when I've looked deeper into the child's record, it was actually submitted to timescales. So that was an incorrect reporting. And this is the kind of thing that we look at, at at the moment. If I just stop sharing so I can see everyone now. Ooh. Sorry. I'm really no good with WebEx. I don't know where it's gone. <laughs> Kelly, it's just Susie here. If you just hover your mouse up to the top of the screen, you just right. go up. There should um, be like a, a little section which says stop sharing. Have you no, found it? Like if you just keep going up, um, mm. only the way is at the bottom, perhaps it could be where you say put share content. Possibly you could put stop sharing. I haven't got that. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm alive. Well, oh, we've done it. it. Lovely. That's great. Well done, Dan. Yeah, I'm used to Microsoft Teams. Sorry about that. Yeah, so um, at the moment, it is just basically raw data. Moving forward in my role, what I'm going to be looking at is looking at what the impact and the outcomes of HDFT is on our children in care. So um, in the County Durham area at the moment, what we have is um, two dedicated looked after children's nurses for the five to 19 population. In Middlesbrough, we've got one at the moment but what we'll be looking at is looking at that impact and outcomes. What are the health needs of our children in care? Um, are those health needs emerging or are they something that, you know, has been present throughout and we're not managing to get to solving those issues? Um, we'll be looking at the importance of health passports and basically advocating for the young, for the young person to take on board their kind of independence in recognising health needs and where they need to go. Um, so we will be looking at quality assuring and, and, and getting some data in terms of what the impact and outcomes are for our children in care in Middlesbrough. Thank you for that, Kelly. Anybody got any questions to Kelly? Councillor Davison. Thanks, thank you, Chair. I have a couple. Uh, am I okay if I do do two yes. questions, yes. Chair? Yes, just oh, do them. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what what do you actually do about the people that, whose cases are not completed? What what can you do? What do you do about these that are not completed? How often do you look at them? It would depend on why it wasn't completed. So I, I, we're quite um, tenacious when we're, we're, we're dealing with our young people. It would be a case of, if, if, for example, if a young person declined the health assessment, it would be about trying to unpick why they were declining it. You know, what's their understanding of the importance of the review health assessment? We need them to understand why we're doing it and not just see it as a tick box exercise. It's about, you know, unpicking 
what the benefit for them is. You know, it, it's not about us managing to hit our KPIs. It's about what that means for that young person. So it's about, you know, being a little bit more persevering and, and trying to understand what their understanding is and, you know, how we can support them in engaging with that assessment. If they were absolutely adamant, we would submit the review health assessment with by other means. So gathering information from the system on record and um, liaison with GPs, if there are any other health economies and um, supporting that young person, for example, CAMS and um, liaise with the carer and try and just get something down on paper that would kind of reflect the needs of the child. But obviously we wouldn't have that child's voice. So we wouldn't just take it as verbatim that, you know, that that patient has um, declined their review health assessment and we'll leave it at that. We are, you know, we do dig a little bit more and do try and explore other ways of trying to, um, to have that assessment completed. Um, for example, there was another one on there, the reason why it was, um, it was massively out of time scales. And when I've looked, I, I believe it's only just been completed. Um, that was due to a carer and um, it was actually a, a grandmother a child lived with grandmother who was um being think of the right word without um it was a little bit difficult to get the grandmother on board with the um the appointments I don't think grandmother realized the importance of this review health assessment being done in within a specific time scale I don't believe that she realized that we have statutory obligations to fulfill um, and grandmother was kind of telling us when she wanted that review assessment to be taken place um, and that was as actually escalated through to um, the service manager for not to 19 who then escalated it to the social worker to try and get to the bottom of, of what that issue was so I suppose I'm just giving you a couple of examples there but what I am trying to say in a very long winded ways that we wouldn't, you know, you know, we would keep plugging away, trying to get that review health assessment done, ideally with the voice of the child, if not then by other means. And how often do you do these assessments, please? So for any child under the age of five, it's every six months and for an, every child over the age of five, it's annually. However, if there was a piece of work that needed completing, so um, for example, the say the school nurse had gone out to do a health uh, a review health assessment, and there were issues with regards to sexual health. We would support that young person in either seeking out um, appropriate sexual health advice and support, or we we, we would support them with that. So it, it, the statutory obligations are every six months or every every year, but depending on what our role was in that in between time would determine how often we would see the child. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anybody else got a question? Yes, Nikki, you want to come in on it? You're on mute, Nikki. Apologies. Um, it was more of an observation and, and a general overview than a question, because obviously I've been working with um, Kelly on some of this. The points that Kelly's raised around um, following up on appointments and engaging with um, the children and the, the carers and the families um, was something that uh, was picked up in deep dives as not being of a particularly good quality or, or, um, or lacking in, in previous services but also kind of nationally as well as locally so the new um service provision um that um is moving forward actually captures a lot of that much better so that we don't miss these opportunities and we offer them what we hope is is a more robust service because that's absolutely what they've asked for there's also something in there around um keeping the message very um uh, obvious and very frequent, you know, having the frequent message out there about roles and responsibilities and what it means for, for the child and the family, actually, if they miss one, rather than if they make one, you know, one of the appointments. Um, so it's it's really picking up on the quality aspect that's expected. 
Um, and is Tia still on the call? Yeah. Tia, I was just going to ask, um, if I may, kind of your experiences around, because I know we asked a lot of um, children who are currently in care or, or left care, you know, what it meant to them around that. What, If you don't mind, obviously, I'm happy, if you, happy for you not to share, but I just wonder what your experiences were uh, from your point of view around your health assessments and, and, and how you felt you were you were supported. I'm going to be honest. Um, no, please I do. did reviews to go to my health assessments because I didn't understand what they were like I was like oh well there's nothing wrong with me why do I need why do I need to see a health health nurse and it it and it was like I didn't actually know what it was yeah great and, I mean, it's it, not great that you didn't go me but out. yeah sorry I shouldn't it only because I've seen some health assessment you would go and get weighed and mm. Um, do all that. I only ever, I only ended up doing that once. Right. Um, any other time, the nurse would come and would come and see me. But um, I know I was supposed that was supposed to happen multiple times where I was supposed to go and get weighed to get my height, have an overall check. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen a lot for me. And and is that because you generally well, didn't understand or nobody was available to do it? It was a bit of both. Yeah. But we do have Lu Louisa on who's a care leaver as well. Can we, okay, can sorry, we move I on? Aware of that. Sorry, can we move on from this conversation? Yeah, no, sorry. I just wanted to to, yeah. to make sure to tear yeah, that we have captured some of the stuff that she's um, yeah. fed back from the point of view of making it better in the future, hopefully. Yeah. Sue, you're on mute. Sue. I agree with the chair, Nikki. I do think it's time to move on from focusing on Tia. Thank you. Um, from my point of view, I, I do think that um, we need to make sure that these young people do understand um, what it's all about, because obviously it could be something quite frightening to them. Um, and I, I think it needs to be well and truly explained what is going to happen, why are we doing it? Um, and can I also ask, is it is it something that that happens in the home or do they go out um, to to a, an office or they go to a clinic or somewhere? They don't chair, they go to the family home and what we are trying to move away from and I'm a great believer in this is that it isn't a, um, a single point of contact for, for a review health assessment. Um, I want it to be a meaningful contact with the young person. I want the young person to be able to get something out of it at the end of the day to understand why it's important for them to acknowledge their own health and development. And it's about, you know, upskilling those young people into being able to deal with their own health needs should they arise at a later date, um, whether they're a young person in care or whether they're care experienced but I, you know i'm i'm a firm believer in that going out to visit a young person annually and asking very kind of intrusive questions um who would share you know wh why would that young person think it was meaningful so I'm, I'm very keen to move away from that kind of single episode of care any further, Carl? It's just an input really from a foster carer's perspective. I mean, as you know, we only do babies. So we have a health visitor come in monthly. Um, clearly, Matt doesn't know anything about it, but it, it, it's all about weighing and, you know, uh, measurements and everything else. Uh, and I know we find it useful um, as carers um, in that uh, you can have that discussion with a, with a medical expert, if you like, you know, so that they're um, to bounce off of, if you like, you know, if you have a, a you know, particular query. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes, Councillor Odin. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to check, you know, with these reports, do they get looked at in the child care review? Like every six months when we have child care review for the children in care, do they looked at there as well? Oh, for, what you'll find is children not to 
not do, to just find. overall health report you know overall health report do, do they get looked at the, the overall at? health report should be the care plan that's generated from a review health assessment should be looked at in in the care review meeting yes yeah yeah so what i meant back then obviously if anything missing and the child not attending or not feeling quite comfortable with this or even carers i think that's be that could be addressed at that point you know the oh, review? Yeah. yeah 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 okay Rachel, yeah, did you want to come in on this? Thanks, Chair. I was just going to reiterate what Kelly Kelly said there. The um, the health assessment information would come through into the CLA, the Child Looked After Review, Councillor yeah. Udden, and also into the care plan and also in into the care team meetings, which would happen on a monthly basis, where the group of professionals would look at, I guess, ways of are those health needs being met? And if a child's refusing to engage with the health assessment, what can we do to try and coax them or help them understand what it's about? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Rachel. Paula, did you want to come in? I think Rachel's covered that. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to uh, make the same point. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Right, we'll move on to the next item, which is uh, item six, which is the participation of children and young people in Middlesbrough. And I believe Hannah Wiseman, you are going to take this uh, report. Thank you. Hello, yes. Um, I was going to be joined by um, Xavier Davis, but he has um, had to dip out um, of this meeting because he's um, running our first in-person Children in Care Council session tonight. Um, so he's not able to um, be here to support me with the presentation, but um, I'll share my screen if that's okay. Um, um, Hello, it's just Susie. Give me a shout if you want me to share your presentation. Yeah, I think it's just loading. You see anything yet? Please let me know when you can. Yes, we can now, Hannah. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so um I thought um what we'd do is I'd just give you a bit of an update. Um I would um I was also planning on just telling you a little bit about who we are as participation people as well. Um so everybody knows who we are and what other work we're doing as well um in children's services. Um so um we are um a organization who've been commissioned by uh middlesbrough um to and we've been around not very long only a few months since august 2021 um to make the services even better for the young people that live in middlesbrough um so we've actually got five kind of strands of work going on in middlesbrough at the minute um, so the first one is the Middlesbrough Youth Council. We are supporting Laurie with the development and um, running of the Youth Council now. Uh, we are also um, launching, well relaunching I must say, the um, Middlesbrough In Care Councils um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those later on um, as we've been doing lots of hard work to get those um, to a position where they're ready to meet back in person again, which is happening tonight, which is very exciting. Um, we're also running the Middlesbrough Young Champions work, um, which I updated at the last uh, updated you on on the last meeting, um, which was um, the the beginning of that was our big takeover event, um, where we had young people from across Middlesbrough jump into the shoes of um, senior decision makers within Middlesbrough Council, and you probably saw quite a lot about it on social media as well. Um, so um, we we're also running that work to develop those young people who took part in Big Takeover and do some other um, exciting events with them um, to get their voices heard. Um, we're also running a Middlesbrough Young Researchers program, um, which is getting to the bottom, basically getting to the bones of what young people like about living in Middlesbrough, what they think needs to improve. Um, and the final thing that we are starting later on um, in the year is a Middlesbrough Young Journalists program, um, which is all about training up young people to be young journalists and doing some of their own um, journalism work and finding out. Um, finding out some stories um, to, to feedback to decision makers. 
Um, so um, that's essentially our all of our strands of work. Obviously, during this meeting, I do tend to give you a little bit more of a focus on the in-care councils um, based off uh, the nature of the meeting. Um, and I'll go on to what's going on for those groups a bit later. Um, I thought I'd just introduce you to a few faces. Um, so you might recognize some of these. Um, so we've got Antonia, who is our um, CEO, and she oversees the whole, um, all, all five strands of work. Um, and then we have myself, um, who you will know, I'm Programme Manager for Participation People, um, and I oversee the Middlesbrough Project, all of them. Um, then we have Laurie, who I think you all know, um, who is a Middlesbrough staff member who is co-located at the moment um, in our team. Um, to really inject the energy and the passion in um, into um, the youth council, um, as well as the young champions projects as well. Um, and Laurie is supported by Fred um, at her youth council sessions. Here on the right, um, and then we have Xavier, who again I think you will know. Um, the uh, we've had a little bit of a structure change um, since the last meeting. Um, Xavier is actually supporting um, participation um, groups two days a week now as part of his apprenticeship, um, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, so Xavier's lead has been on the in-care councils and a lot of Xavier's hard work has gone into um, the um, relaunch of the in-care groups um, again starting this week. Um, and then we have Kathy, um, who is contracted in at the moment um, to support Xavier um, with the group's relaunch. Um, we have also have Ed and Alice who are at the bottom here who are leading on the Young Researchers programme that I spoke to you about earlier. Um, a bit of a progress report on um, from um, December. Um, they have been Kathy and Xavier have been working really, really hard to plan out um, the roadmap ahead for in-care councils and care leave forum. Um, so that's the Children in Care Council and the Mini Children in Care Council. So they range um, age 7 to 12 and then um, age 13 to 17. And then the care leave forum is for the 18s and overs. Um, these are relaunching, like I said tonight. Um, with the mini kick and the Children in Care Council starting tonight and then the Kelly before them on Thursdays. Um, we had planned a celebration event for the care leavers um, ready for Christmas, um, but unfortunately, due to the high numbers of COVID cases before Christmas, um, this had to be postponed. Um, so this is now actually going to be scheduled for February half term, where we're hoping the cases will be a little bit lower and we can keep everybody a little bit safer. Um, but those events are in the pipeline. Um, and then the Kelly Buzz event is, um, it was planned completely ready to go Christmas, but we did have to postpone it at short notice, unfortunately. Um, the Young Champions Group, um, so they're the young people. We have some care leavers um, and children in care in that group. Um, they've been doing some training and development workshops um, and they have had AQA accredited training in teamwork, communication and confidence skills. Um, the Young Researchers Programme has just started and they're finding out um, exactly um, what, what it is about Middlesbrough that young people like and what they don't like and what needs to change. And then the youth council are actually running an election um, at the moment um, and to get some um, members of youth parliament for Middlesbrough who can represent Middlesbrough on a national and regional stage as well. And so that's what we've been up to in December. Um, in kind of looking forward to the future um, or the not so very, not so distant future, actually, um, as the groups are actually starting tonight for Mini Children in Care Council and the Children in Care Council. Um, these groups are um, going to be running from the East Side Hub and um, the Caliber Forum is going to be running from the Pathways Building um, and phase 
flyers have been shared far and wide as well as individual contacts made with young people inviting them to come along so hopefully at the next meeting i can give you a bit of an update about what they've been getting up to in these groups which will be amazing and really exciting and um, so like i said before these are being facilitated by xavier and with afi as well supporting xavier to do that um in terms of the roadmap ahead, um, in terms for January, um, the focus of the, was on, was on the relaunch um, and um, then also starting to work with the, um, the groups to um, develop their skills like teamwork and confidence, communication um, and start work on a satisfaction survey for children in care who um, I've had a meeting already with the audit team um, to see exactly how we can fit into what they're already doing. We can make sure that the work that the Children in Care Council are doing fits in really well with what they're already doing. Um, uh, we are really looking forward to running through the rest of the roadmap, um, which includes um, running another workshop for corporate parents again, if there is demand for it. Um, running our celebration events for children in care and care leavers, um, as well as running some social activities, uh, residential, which again had to get postponed from December due to the high COVID cases, uh, which we're hoping to run in the spring instead now, um, as well as um, some other stuff, which you'll see on the, the um, on the roadmap, um, including reversing reverse mentoring, which is where young people get to uh, mentor a decision maker um, and um, tell the decision maker exactly what it's like being a young person in middle school in care. Um, but um, I'll leave that there because you can read through it yourself. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but um, I've just popped one little slide in at the end just to reassure you, especially based off of previous conversation we had at the beginning of this meeting around um, COVID-19 and some of the extra precautions were taken to ensure that the Children in Care Council, the mini kick and the Kelly before them can go ahead in person as safe as possible. Um, so there's a few extra measures that we've brought in, including a pre-session COVID questionnaire, um, which is sent out to all the young people before they come, um, which is um, basically asking them if they've been in contact with anybody with COVID or if they have any COVID symptoms. Um, if they don't, if, if they don't, then they're more than welcome to come. If they do, then we will try and make um, accommodations for them to attend virtually to make sure that everybody in that space is safe. Um, we are temperature checking young people as they arrive to make sure that their temperature is of a normal level. If they have a high temperature, when we will be asking the young people again if we can make arrangements to get them back home and then they can dial in virtually um we're taking lateral flow tests making sure young people are taking lateral flow tests before they come or if they haven't taking one at the beginning and um, before they join the main group um as well as the hand sanitizer the mask wearing and ensuring that um our spaces are well ventilated and ensuring that if, if they are at the minute because it's so cold that the young people have a coat um, to wear um, and in the event that any national or local guidance changes and um, then what we'll be doing is we will be going back to a virtual delivery um, for those young people um, but I think that's it from me thank you for that Hannah thank you just wait for you to take your screen down before. Thank you. Uh, anybody got any questions for Hannah? Uh, Councillor Higgins. Thank you, Chair. Hannah, um, have you got any uh, statistics that say how many children are involved in each of these groups? And I know some of them are just starting again, but have you got any numbers? And if not, could you? have them for next time i think next time would be the um would would be yeah the most ideal way to um, give you those numbers just because as it's relaunching um we are hoping that loads, a lot more young people will start accessing those groups so absolutely they can be provided for the next meeting or could you send it to the members of the group prior to the next meeting 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. I can make sure it's included in the report that gets circulated before the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any, fur any further questions? I have a question myself, Hannah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's about the um, Youth Council. Uh, is there one mm -hmm. member from each school involved in the Youth Council? I think the, it used to be years ago where they did elections in schools to elect one person from each school. Does that still happen? Um, well, that would be the ideal situation. There are um, not that many members at the moment. Um, the way that the um, elections are running is that a young person, I think we've got eight candidates for the national members of youth parliament elections. Um, so they will be, um, they put themselves forward and then it goes to a vote, which any young person in Middlesbrough can vote in. And it's usually done through the schools or sometimes youth groups as well can vote. Um, and those young people will campaign and get their classmates to vote for them. And the person that gets the most number of votes then gets to be the representative who is the member of youth parliament. Um, in terms of the actual youth council, we are aiming to get somebody from each school representative on that council and also from each ward um, represented. So every area is represented within Middlesbrough. Um, that is not currently the case, um, but it is something that we are working towards. Thank you. Tia, I think you have a question. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I just... Do you have a plan if there's not many young people um, attending the meetings or the groups? Do you have a plan to, to make it more appealing for young people to join? Like, it, if it doesn't work this way, do you have a backup plan to make it more appealing? Or do you have, like, another plan to make it more catching for young people to be able to join? Because the more young people do it, the better. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have got um, our roadmap, obviously, um, but what um, we have been asked to do is to come in and add a little bit of excitement into that. Um, so you can see in the roadmap, there's various um, um, kind of social events put in there as well. So there's an opportunity for the young people to go out and do something really exciting as a thank you for being part of the groups. Um, and yeah, exactly. That's the whole reason we're here to kind of up those numbers. And at the minute in January and probably into February as well, we'll be on a big recruitment push to make sure that we get as many young people as possible involved in those groups. Because like you said, it's better to hear from a lot of young people's voices. Um, the other thing that we do as part of our work as well is say we've got and the care leavers on the care leaver forum is we encourage those 10 care leavers to think of ways where we can get more care leavers voices so that's voices of people who are not represented or represented on our group um but could they come to a session where they answer some questions for us or could they um watch a video that we've created to give them some information about something to make sure that they're spreading that message far and wide as well Any further questions? Can I come back, Chair, yes. please? Yes, uh, Tia, I understand what you mean because for a number of years, that's been the problem of how we get young people to participate in this type of event. Because a lot of people, a lot of young people are shy and they don't like speak, speaking in company. To the friends, that's fine, but to people that don't know. So I know it's going to be a difficult job, but uh, I hope it works. And uh, I'm sorry, maybe a no, good idea okay. is to ask the young people who are already part of the groups, what would make it more appealing to people your, your yes. age? And maybe it's better to ask them than us just thinking, oh, we'll, we'll put it on social media, maybe that's a better way, but yeah. it might be better even for them and their ideas of how we can get more people. I think that's that, that's a good idea because. Uh, the, sorry, Chair, do you mind? No, well, you're having a conversation. Here yes, with, sorry, uh, it's, it's, I shouldn't. It's I know. Right. Uh, no, Hannah, would you like to come back on this, please? 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so what we've done in um, what we have developed as, as an organisation, participation people, we have all, we have developed a um, recognition and reward policy, um, which um, we can actually adapt with our groups. And what that means is we can ask the young people who are accessing our groups, what would you like as a reward for your um, participation in this group? Um, so it might be that they want Amazon vouchers, or it might be they want a residential trip um, to do some adventurous activities, or it might be that they want a trip to Alton Towers. Um, and then we can work that with the young people so they are actually getting what they want out of it. So for their participation, they're being rewarded with an end of year trip to Alton Towers, for example, if that's what they say. So yeah, we have that as well, which we're hoping to go through with our young people to make sure that they're feeling valued and um, making sure that they want to continue working with us as well as want to start working with us in the first place. Thank you. Any further questions? Can I just make another comment actually? Um, I do believe that all corporate parents are invited to these sessions, Hannah. Um, so if you're able to go, please call in and see the um, young people in this. I'm sure they'd be delighted to see you and be interested to know how you felt about what's going on. So thank you for that. We will now thank move you, on. Sorry, Tia, did you want to say something else? No. Councillor Halawi. Yes, please. Thanks, Chair. Could we have a list then, please, Hannah, of the dates and times of the future meetings of the uh, Children and Care Councils, etc.? Then we'd have a heads up for when we might be able to attend. But okay, Chair, thanks. Yes, thank you, Councillor Halawi. Any further comments? Hannah? Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it's just to uh, just reiterate the point that we would absolutely love to see any of you at any time, but please let us know if you are going to come just so we can make sure that we structure the session around what you might want to talk to the young people about and make sure that they're, it, it, your visit is explained to them as well, because it's very much a young person space. And although we love to see you, um, it's just good to explain that to the young people before they have new faces turning up. Thank you. I will right, we'll move on now. We'll go on to item seven, which is the Corporate Parenting Board Strategy Action Plan. Um, and the head of the Looked After Children and Corporate Parenting is to present this. Are you Thank ready? You, no, no it, I'm going to present that report today. All right. Thank you, Paula. Um, Susie, are you okay to share the report, please? Chair, in October, I presented a full and detailed report which measured against every theme um, against the Corporate Parenting Permanence Action Plan. Um, Susie, sorry, I think that one's the scorecard. Apologies for that, Paul. I just find correct report. I know, moment. sorry. The first part of the report, it's been circulated to, to the whole of board. The first part of the board of the report, sorry, does go back over the findings of Ofsted, which is um which, which is repeated from the, the last report, but I felt it was really important to still set it in context in terms of where we were in 2019. But I don't propose to go through that in detail today. It's just there for, for board to, to reference. Um the purpose of today's report is to review any updated actions since the last time I presented the report in October. Sorry, Paula, I'm just having a few technical difficulties. If you just give me just a couple of moments, I will find it. Sorry about it. Fine. Um, would you like me to try and share it? If you can, that would be great, but I should be able to in a minute. It's just trying to locate the application but it's just not doing it for me it's, it's i think it's tuesday afternoon
Is that sharing? It is. Okay, thank you. So, as I've said, the first part of the report is for, for reference only. Um, and I'm going to take people through the updated actions since the last presentation. So, um, just as a reminder, there are six theme thematic areas um, of the Corporate Parenting Permanence Action Plan, and there is a lead accountable officer for each area, which is detailed there. So, the first theme is around strengthening, strengthening permanency in our social work practice. And since the last time um, I presented this report, we have had a permanence pathway, which is now developed and signed off. That allows social workers um, an opportunity to understand the full journey of the looked after child, and it will be linked to um, different procedures um, for, for social workers. So they understand um, which pathway to follow. We have a legal gateway panel, which is embedded. Um, which again takes children through the, the initial part of their looked after journey. And that comes with a legal gateway tracker, which is in place to progress and track cases to prevent any delay for our looked after children. You heard last time that we were commissioning um, strengthening practice to deliver some permanence training, and that is underway and is being delivered to the full workforce currently. In October, we had Permanence Month um, for staff, and we had a series of hot topics and short training programmes for staff to come and, um, and be updated regarding any new practices. There's a full review of all of our permanence procedures that are underway. Um, they're all in various stages of completion, but they're all underway and on track to be completed. We have a workforce recruitment strategy, which has now been approved. Um, recruitment of staff is underway with the new offer, and we're hoping that that will attract experienced staff um, so that we can support our improvement journey and develop um, improvements in practice. We've developed practice standards for children who are placed with parents. So we all understand what good looks like for children uh, and for practices for children in these placements. And we've also we've done the same for those children in connected care as placements. We have a working party which has been launched and is ongoing, and that's looking at um, supporting procedures for children who are being reunified back to parents' care, and that's to make sure that assessments are robust and that children that who are returning to parents' care have robust, tight support plans that are reviewed regularly to ensure that they remain there and those placements remain stable. Theme two is around growing multi-agency partnerships. Our permanency monitoring group, the you heard about last time continues to track all children who are subject to full care orders and who are moving through their journey to permanence. That's attended with adoption teas uh, by adoption teas valley when we review those children who are pregnant are, are very strong and the, the process is very well supported by um, our adoption teas valley service. We have strengthened reviewing procedures um, with regards to children's education. And you heard earlier um, about the fact that we have a strengthened reviewing process where we look at children who have less than 25 hours of education, who aren't on a, a school role, or who are experiencing fixed term exclusions. So we make sure that we work in partnership to review those children regularly so that they can prog progress on to receive their full entitlement and achieve good outcomes in school. There's been a multi-agency audit in October of, sorry, of um, children who have got education healthcare plans so that we can make sure that that joint up working with our partners in education is strong um, and that children with um, special educational needs, we are reviewing them within our work within social care to make sure that it, it is incorporated into their looked after care plan. And we are making sure that um, for looked after children, they're attaining well and receiving good outcomes and support within education. 
Our permanency monitor monitoring group is also attended by our fostering team and it's supported by uh, one of the managers within our review and development unit. I've mentioned there that that does track all children that are subject to full care orders. We continue to be supported um, and have a commissioned social work team, which remains in place and is supporting children to achieve permanence in a timely manner. And that has supported the reduction in the numbers of looked after children. Sorry, can you hear me? My computer appears to have crashed and won't move on. We can still hear you, Paula. Sorry, Chair, my computer's crashed, so it's struggling to uh, move on with the report. Just give me a minute. I'm so sorry, I think I may need to stop sharing and share again. Apologies for that, I'm just going to try and turn my video off um, to see if that helps. Susie, would you be able to share the report? Because I think it might help Paula in terms of her yeah, I'm just going to send it to Caroline because I'm having some difficulty sharing, Rachel, but I'm just going to send it to Caroline and I'll ask Caroline to pop it on the screen. Yeah, I think it must be a kind of technical issue this afternoon. Everyone seems to be struggling a bit. It was awful this morning as well. So, um, oh, Paula, you seem to have got it back on the screen again. Yeah, I was just going to look it... to see if that was any better. Uh, sometimes it helps to turn your camera off, doesn't it? That seems to be working at the minute, but I'll send it to Caroline just in case. And then if we do crash again, then we can, we've got an alternative arrangement. Thank you. Apologies for that. So in terms of theme four, it's about strengthening the voice of children and young people. Um, we've had life story work training, which took place in October um, last year. We now have um, a large cohort of staff who are uh, trained in life story work training. That includes our resource workers and also our um, residential staff. We have the commission service in place, um, and you've heard from Hannah today, to, to develop participation for looked after children throughout the council, um, but particularly for, for looked after children. And the children, the recruitment for the Children in Care Council is ongoing, as you've heard. We have our care experience young people who now attend corporate parenting board and offer us offer us challenge um, and, and support us with the work that we do. We also have um, our adoption Tees Valley service who have recruited additional staff to ensure that children who are going through the process of, adop of adoption also receive good quality um, life story work. Care experienced young people delivered um, the workshop to corporate parenting board regarding communication to young people last year, which was very well received. And as you've heard from Hannah, a number of um, our care experienced young people participated in the big takeover and were involved in projects to improve service delivery. We continue to improve the way we capture data with regards to permanence. We have the performance report that's delivered to each corporate parenting board, and that's to ensure that there's a rigorous oversight and challenge. The permanency tracker remains in place and supports us to drive effective um, changes and ensure that children progress on to permanence in a timely way. We have the LCS transformation program that's ongoing and it's de it's developing pathways for connected carers and special guardians um, and that's to allow for more sophisticated performance reporting. It will allow us to track um, more effectively and have improved management oversight of those young people and their journeys. 
With regards to theme six, it's supporting permanence in education, employment and training. Our virtual school and social care jointly have delivered hot topic sessions to staff in October last year regarding how we work effectively together, um, how we improve the quality of personal education plans and how we make sure that that feeds into the, the supervision and the care plans for looked after children. There's training scheduled for designated teachers in, in October, which is going to be delivered by our virtual head. And that's regarding the role of education as, as corporate parents within education. We have strength and joint working with the virtual school, and that's led to the weekly reviews of children who are absent from school alongside health and, and social care. Um, and within those meetings, we do review those, those children who are absent due to COVID or any um, class or school year closures due to COVID. So thinking about how that's impacting on permanence for looked after children, over the last 12 months, we know that the looked after population has continued to reduce. That was at a height of 702 young people in September 2020. As of today, that's 510 children. Um, and at the point of writing this report um, last week, I could evidence that in the last 12 months, 205 children had started to become looked after compared to 344 children who ceased to become looked after. Um, and as long as we continue on that journey, we will see an ongoing reduction in the numbers of looked after children and we'll see that they're securing permanence in, in a more timely way. We measure, we measure the number of children in care through looking at how many children per 10,000 of, um, of the population are looked after. And that reduced from 197.4 children per 10,000 in November um, 2020, that should say, sorry, to 158.8 children in November 2021. This is the lowest rate that it's been in 12 months and it's continuing to reduce month on month. With regards to children achieving permanence through adoption, we've had 19 children achieve um, adopt, be granted adoption orders since the 1st of April. That includes four children um, of BAME, four sibling groups of two, and two children aged four years and over. Uh, we know that sometimes this, these cohorts of children, we can find it more difficult at times to, to secure adoptive placements for them. We have more children in Middlesbrough that have been adopted um, this year so far than any of the other Teesside authorities. And the number of days that it's taken between a child being made subject to a placement order and being adopted has reduced significantly from 558 days in 2019-20 to 342 days in 2021-22. We currently have a further 38 children progressing to adoption and all but two of these children are linked to adopters, which is very strong performance. We've had 76 children secure permanence through special guardianship orders in the last 12 months. And we've seen a reduction in the number of children that are cared for in connected carers placements. We have 47 children currently placed with parents and that's reduced from 52 children that I reported to you all in, in October last year and from a height of 99 children in September 2020. We've seen a reduction in the number of children who were cared for in external residential placements. There was 74 in June last year and 47 in December. Um, and we know that those children who were cared for locally in the in middle within Middlesbrough and within our own placements achieve better outcomes. So that's um, a statistic that we're really proud of. School attendance for looked after children was 91% in November. And we've had no children permanently excluded from school in the last five years. There's 3.1% of looked after children that are receiving less than 25 hours and that amounts to 11 children. So that is, it, that's a low um, 
performance sorry high performance low numbers of children but we do continue to have tight oversight of them through education and social care the risks identified to making ongoing progress really are um, the increase in demand across the service and across the Tees Valley region in the whole and risks associated with the recruitment of staff in the looked after service and the care leaving service. But I did talk um, previously about the, the efforts that we're making to um, attract more experienced staff. Um, the next steps are detailed there, but they involve the ongoing work with the data team to develop the permanent dashboard and scorecard for the life story work compliance and quality to continue to be driven. Um, the ongoing reduction and tracking of the number of children residing in external residential placements. I'll continue to uh, report progress against the action plan on a quarterly basis. We've also um, deployed into the service a number of practice leads that are supporting us to improve the quality of practice. We have participation people that continue to work with us and recruit children in care uh, to the Children in Care Council. And this month we've got a, uh, quite an intense audit programme, auditing children who are looked after. And that's going to, we'll use those findings to help us develop um, the service further and improve practice. And then the ongoing recruitment of permanent staff. That's the end of the presentation. If it's going to let me stop sharing now, then I'll be available to answer any questions. I don't think it's going to let me stop sharing now. Susie, can either you or Caroline help to take this down? <clears throat> I can't. Um, I have tried. Caroline, are you able to assist in taking down the presentation or is it just the um, presenter who's able to do that? It's just the oh, presenter, sorry, Susie. Yeah, no, it's okay. Can they not just click on the X at the top right hand corner? <laughs> Think it would close it's, down. Uh, it's frozen yeah. and it won't let me exit, so sorry. Paula, will it let you exit the meeting altogether? It won't, no. Chair, would you like to try and continue with questions? And if we just ask all so, members to raise their see. hand. I can't if, see everybody perhaps we else. could just ask board members to raise their hand within the um the kind of the chat function, you know, like on the screen, and then I can just let you know if anyone has a question. So for example, Councillor Halawi has a question. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Halawi. Thank you, Chair. It wasn't a question, actually. It was a comment to congratulate all concerned in some of the amazing uh, improvements that we can witness through this report. It, it's quite outstanding that we've made so much progress for the children in our town, and I'm sure it's making a huge difference to so many children and families' lives. I feel really uplifted to know that this is work in progress and we're going absolutely along the right path. So I'd like to convey our thanks, I think, on behalf of all of us, Chair, if I'm not right, to everyone concerned. Thank you, Councillor Halawi. I would support that very much indeed because it is such a positive report. And when you when you see things like that, it does make you feel much better. At least you think 
for goodness sake, we are now going in the right direction and everything seems to be on track. Um, so yes, thank you to everybody concerned. Um, it, it is a good, great achievement. Is there anybody else would like to speak? Yeah, so uh, Councillor Odin, can I can I speak, please? Yeah, you, you can, Councillor Odin. Yeah, certainly. All right, we're back. Oh, I've got yeah. you back now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, ter in terms of the comment, obviously, I echo what the chair said and the councillor Harari said. I think it's a fantastic report, and I really, you know, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm listening and I'm I'm just moving forward with this, you know. So it's so positive and really absolutely brilliant. I really appreciate it, and congratulate you, obviously, as as uh, Councillor Harry said. Uh, only question I wanted to ask, actually, on the life study work on the four, uh, theme four, you mentioned. I can't remember was it Paula or uh, Rachel? Oh, well, both of you were involved in that, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, are, are you involving foster care in this sort of uh, training, the life story training? I know you mentioned the residential staff and there's some of the resource work are involved. And uh, have we got any foster carers involved in that uh, training, the, uh, the life story work? Uh, Chair, I think Paula has actually had to exit the meeting altogether to get the um, to get the presentation down. So she's busy coming back in, but I'll kind of chip in and answer those questions if that would be helpful. Yes, in terms you. of in terms of the life story work, we've started off Councillor Odin by training a big cohort of uh, Middlesbrough Council staff to be able to support, um, you know, more life story work. Um, we're also looking at purchasing. Um, a life story platform where foster carers, parents and carers, young people can upload um, regular updates, photographs, you know, to build a life story work. We haven't trained foster carers in, on this training package, but they're absolutely critical in gathering the life story work. So at the staff who we've trained will support foster carers. It'll be a bit like train the trainers in that mm -hmm. respect, we will support foster carers in terms of gathering that life story information because they are critical. They're the ones who are taking the photographs at the birthday parties and taking the photographs at brownies and guides. And um, so they'll be critical, but we haven't as yet trained them with this training package. Right, so they're on the process now, in the process, yeah. in the can, yeah. That's brilliant, yeah. Like, as you said, I'm there for the crucial role though, with the children's life, you know, and, and that this is life to work is quite unique identity with the children as well. You know, they looked after the children when go over the long term fostering or even adoption plans. You know? So yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. That's Thank great. you. How did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, well, back up what's just been said there already. We've been approached uh, in the past uh, for children that have left our care, if you like, or in our care. Uh, where life story work's been uh, been uh, worked upon to provide photographs and uh, and, and and stories or, or anecdotes, if you like, that can go into that document. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you. Any further questions? <clears throat> I wonder if we could send something out to all members um, about that. Would that be possible? So. Butcher, maybe um, send some of the slides at, at the end where we had the good, the percentages, et cetera, which showed the reduction in the number of children, et cetera. I think that would be a really good thing to send out to um, members, yeah. as we do have members who actually are really keen to see, obviously, the well, we all are quite keen to see the reduction, but, but people who don't realise just how much has been done and and the reduction in the numbers. If we could send those last slides out, that would be helpful. Yes, Rachel. It was just to, to reiterate that, you know, whilst we we do, uh, we are really pleased that we've reduced the number of looked after children. It's not about just bringing the numbers down, Councillor Hobson. I know, you, you know, I know, I know you realise that because actually what we've done is work more effectively with children on the edge of care. So we've prevented them coming into care. And then a lot of the work that Paula and the team have done around, you know, improving practice around permanence. So children have exited care to their forever homes in a timely way. Um, and it's been that that those two strategies that res have resulted in a net reduction over time. And it's been a gradual reduction over time. So I think that is a really important message for people to understand more broadly. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, Sue? 
Uh, just to say, Councillor, that we'll pull it together into a briefing so there's some context around it as well as just sending the slides out. But I think it's a really good idea because um, all members are corporate parents, so um, it's giving them information about their children. So thank you for that. Any further questions? Paula, you'd like to come back in? Chair, yeah, I just wanted to apologise for the technical issues. <laughs> We've had quite a lot of technical issues today, Paula, so I wouldn't worry about it if I were with you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No, well, we, we're moving on now to uh, Claire Walker. Uh, Hi, Chair. And who, she's going to present the, the sufficiency action plan to the board, please. I'm a little bit worried to share this. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I'm not. I hope this works. <laughs> uh, sorry, chair. It's just Susie here. Claire and um, Caroline's yep. going to share it for you, just oh, so that there isn't any you. technical problem. Caroline, can you see if you can pop it on the screen, please? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Caroline. Right. Um, just to um, say that my structure follows on um, from Paula's, so similar to what um, she made reference to, point number one, um, if you could just scroll down for me, Caroline, please, um, is the same detail that was in the in the last report, so I haven't made any amendments to that. I think, like Paula says, it just gives the, the background to where this came from, so there's no um, no changes to that from the, from the last time I presented in, uh, I think it was... Uh, October or November, sorry, thank you. So I'll just start on uh, number two. Um, just to say that obviously we, we um, have actually undertaken a review of the Commission Action Plan, so that's been updated and shared with the um, group and is, is going through a sign-off process. So we're just making sure that the, the Action Plan stays live and it, it, it moves with us. Um, under the themes, uh, the first one, which is strengthening the commissioning, um, work on the implementation of contract continues. Um, I think in the last report, I hadn't really really um, indicated what contract was and um, so just to say it's a financial system that links directly to our uh, children's care system so it's a way of improving um, the payment of um, invoices so it, it removes the invoice for for um, for placements and makes the payment process much smoother but it also has a wider implication into improving uh, data flow and information on demand as well uh, which I hadn't put in there so my apologies and um, the there is, um, unfortunately, the likelihood that the um, the timescale on that will change um, because it's connected to LCS. And as Paula mentioned, there's some transformation work going on. Um, I think there might be some changes that may be required to LCS in the way that we input things in order to make contract work. Um, there is a, a formal change control process through our uh, PMO um, in place, so I'll make sure that that is um, followed and that is duly signed off and amended in the action plan. Um, I'm looking to develop a market engagement plan, which I'm hoping to present to Children's DMT in February. That'll just strengthen how we as the council are engaging with our market um, across uh, a myriad of services, not just um, residential and fostering, but other services that we deliver um, across um, uh, um, all of children's services. And um, so that's just to help us with our relationship management uh, and improving that system. Um, theme two, if you could just scroll down a little bit for me, please. Uh, oh, for me, please. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, increasing of placements closer to home. Really good news that I think Paula's already um, touched upon, but our internal occupancy has increased um, and we currently have 23 young people placed in um, our internal residential provision, uh, which is really positive and has increased uh, month on month as, we, as, we, as we've progressed and the, and the new homes and um, work to those homes has um, been completed and they've opened. Uh, we continue to be involved uh, across the mm -hmm. regional work, so that's the 12 local authorities across the North East. We're continually, continually, can't even speak today, my apologies, continually, no, we're always looking for opportunities to work together and collaborate, I'll go with that one. Um, so we're currently working on a, an AFA framework at the moment and taking that forward. Um, we continue, um, as I say, to look for opportunities either on a wider regional or a sub-regional basis. So it could be just a couple of local authorities, it could be all 12 of us. So that work is always ongoing as well. Um, whilst you know the priority is Middlesbrough and meeting our local needs, sometimes there's an opportunity um, to um, 
do that collaboratively with other local authorities and thank you Sue I'm going into an acronyms aren't I so I do apologize and um, theme three uh, growing early intervention and prevention uh, we've got a really good service and um, pause uh, this service looks to work with women who've had um, two or more children removed from their care and um, it, it's it's really intensive work with you with the with the woman and um, just to try and avoid any um further pregnancies or should they um obviously choose to become pregnant and the child remains in their care and um, that's been really positive it's managed to still continue delivering through covid which is excellent i think it's working with approximately 11 uh, women at the moment and is going really well and we've just agreed a further extension to that so that's really positive um, again, we're looking at, um, we had a, a concern and we're aware of our use of unregulated settings, uh, which is where we place young people um, 16 plus with a support need. Um, we've actually made the decision as, as our own council, we work um, regionally with other local authorities on quality monitoring. Uh, we had, we wanted to do some more intensive work, so we've actually undertaken our own um, monitoring contract monitoring visits on those provisions and um, because obviously they are not registered with Ofsted so we just wanted to be um, assured that we were confident about the service and the quality being delivered and um, those um, visits are nearly completed with the last ones happening next week and so far the results have been uh, positive uh, showing good quality service being delivered which is really really positive uh, in addition and further strengthening that we've introduced our own version of reg regulation 44 visits so regulation 44 visits are statutory that happen in children's residential uh, provisions however they can't happen in an unregulated provision so we're working with um no, uh, national youth advocacy youth youth advocacy service uh, abbreviated to nias if i if i go into an acronym um and, and we're working with them to undertake our own version of a Reg 44. So it isn't a formal Reg 44, it's an unregulated visit, uh, which again has been really positive because the, that's an independent person going into the provision. And obviously they also get the views and talk to the young person in placement. Uh, again, that's um, hap happening in parallel to the contract monitoring visit. So that should all be completed by the end of January. And we'll be reporting back to uh, Children's DMT on how that's, um, on, on the outcomes of that work. Thank you. Um, enhancing the, the learning outcomes, we continue to um, try and understand if boarding schools can offer any placement opportunities for um, our children and young people. That's still very much in its infancy, but obviously um, where it's appropriate, we're just wanting to understand if there's any opportunities uh, that can be taken forward there. Um, in relation to fostering, uh, the business case and new service delivery model for the in-house service uh, work continues. And at this point in time, a really positive outcome is that our in-house placements has overtaken the number of external IFAs, uh, really positive. So when I did this report, we had 169 internal uh, in-house uh, fostering placements compared to 157 in the external market. Um, and currently Middlesbrough is running another um, significant recruitment campaign to to um, increase our in-house foster care numbers. So we're really looking forward to seeing that internal number continue to increase. Um, we are weekly uh, monitoring our residential placements and that's been a really, I think, a really powerful and really positive um, introduction. Um, it, it's, it's weekly, but it's really good to see the actual shift and decrease in the uh, reliance on the external market and to show how our internal market and our internal numbers have increased. Um, as at the 4th of January, we had 68 placements of which 23, 34% uh, were internal versus 45. Um, 66% being external, which is really positive and continues to, um, you know, decrease with the work that we're doing. So that's really positive. And again, sorry, I'm just repeating myself, but obviously it's really good news that we've got um, 326 fostering placements, but the majority of those uh, being in-house compared to external. Um, as we've mentioned on this call, um, COVID, I think, is the biggest impact at the moment on staffing levels. We continue to monitor and work with the market closely. Um, and obviously, if there was any issues, we would, <coughs> excuse me, highlight those and work with the market as, as much as possible. Within children's, it seems to be, I don't want to jinx anything, but in the external market, pretty stable. We do have incidents where we have positive cases, but they don't seem to be um, 
too many and uh, not negatively impacting um, and we're not aware of any staffing issues in the external market that haven't been managed to be covered um, by other avenues such as agency staff or um, sessional staff that the providers have. Um, obviously moving forward we're just going to continue to meet uh, monthly uh, for the um, action plan group so that all the um, leads are working together to make sure we're, there, we're driving forward with all the actions and obviously I will ensure that any change controls um, are secured where there's any changes to um, deadlines or new areas identified. Thank you. And um, my apologies, I know I do talk very fast in, in an acronym, so if anybody's got any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Claire. Um, another positive report there. Has anybody got any questions? See anybody? No questions, right. All I can do then is say thank you very much indeed. Um, for that report, as I say, it was very positive and, uh, you know, we're definitely on the right track. Um, Excellent. Next, Thank you, Chair. The next item is um, item number nine, form performance against corporate parenting strategy. Um, is this Rachel, are you doing this? Paula's presenting this, Chair. Right. Paula Jemson. Susie, are you okay to share the report? I don't try this time. Oh, no. Caroline, <laughs> think gonna... best. I best not. <laughs> yeah, Caroline's going to put it on the screen for you, Paula, because my machine Thank you. is also playing silly. Thank you. So, um, Caroline, just pop it up. Thanks, thanks, Caroline. No worries. Um... Caroline, if you're struggling, I've got it, um, so I'll just pop it up. Thank you. So this report relates to the corporate parenting scorecard and it measures um, our performance in relation to permanence. Um, at the last board, corporate parenting board did ask me to add a few slides regarding the demographics of our looked after children so i have i have done that um so the first slide relates to the gender of our um the gender population of our looked after children and you'll see from this that 54 percent of our current looked after population are male one percent of these young boys are unaccompanied asylum seekers 45 percent of the looked after population are female with regards to ethnicity, the highest percentage of children in our care are of a white British ethnicity and 81% of our looked after population are white British. 8% of children are of mixed ethnicity uh, and 7% are black or black British. If you could move on please, Susie. In terms of the reason for becoming looked after, you'll see that the most common reason for a child to become looked after is due to abuse or neglect. We've had 97 children become looked after in the, six month, in the last six months um, to protect them from this cause. That's a slight increase from 2020-2021. Um, However, remains significantly higher, as you can see on the chart, than our statistical neighbours and the in England average. You could move on, please. We've heard quite a lot about demand and you'll see from this slide that uh, a kind of a visual aid in terms of the reduction in our um, looked after population. So in January 2021, there was 617 children looked after by Middlesbrough and that there's been quite a rapid reduction over the year, which is, demonstrate, is demonstrating a 17% decrease over the last 12 months and overall a 27% reduction since the height that we talked about in September 2020. So at the moment for every 
0.6 child entering care, one child exit, exits care. And we've maintained um, that ratio for the last six months, which has shown the, the, the gradual decrease. Board asked for information about children who we have prevented from becoming looked after and our Future for Families service are supporting children on the edge of care. They've supported 50 young people on the edge of care since they went live and of those 50 children, 74%, which amounts to 37 children, haven't become looked after. So 21 of those were supported on a child in need level and 11 have remained supported on a child in need level. 47%, that's 10 children, no longer require a child in need plan and are no longer supported by the local authority at all. So I've made significant progress and are no longer requiring a service. 16 children were subject to child protection procedures. 10 remain supported on a child protection level and four have stepped down to receive support on a child in need level. Two children no longer require any support from children's services and, and are closed. Please, could you move on? In terms of caseloads and the demand on, on social, care, um, social work resource, caseloads have consistently reduced since December 2020 and throughout the improvement journey. The average per se service area does vary slightly. Um, but the average caseload across children's social care is currently 16.7, which is a significant reduction from where we started at 22.3 in December 2020-21. So that is going to support um, improvements in, in practice. Thank you. I don't wish to re repeat myself in terms of what's already been said in the pre previous presentation, but these graphs here do um, evidence the reduction and demonstrate how we've reduced the numbers of children placed at um, home with parents subject to care orders. That's the first graph. And the second graph um, demonstrates the number of days that it takes between children entering care and placed in an adoptive placement. Um, just with regards to CP11 there, the second graph, what you don't quite see is January 2021, um, that if we kind of extended that to that date, the, the number of days that it takes children between entering care and becoming adopted was actually 558 days. So you can see from that that, that there is significant reduction since that um, time and that's taken from the adoption scorecard data. We can move on please. With regards to placement stability, this is a really strong area of performance for Middlesbrough. Um, less than 5% of our looked after children have experienced a placement breakdown in the last 12 months. In January 2021, 123 children in our care had experienced three or more placements over the last 12 months, and that was amounting to 20% of the population. This is reduced and we now only, only have 36 children in our care who have experienced three or more placements in the last 12 months. That's 7% of our current population. And we're achieving this through um, improvements in practice, making sure that our care plans are reviewed more regularly, that they are more effective in supporting placement stability, um, stronger partnership working and stronger management oversight. You could move on, please. In terms of outcomes and qu uh, quality of practice, this final slide just talks um, briefly about quality of uh, about compliance and, and social care practice. So our performance reports tell us that 94% of our looked after children have been seen within the last six months. That's a 5% decrease from November's data. So this is taken from December's performance report, but it has been consistently higher over 90% since May. 
our management oversight of cases has improved and we have 94% of looked after children who have had management oversight in the form of a supervision within the month of December. 99% of our children have got a recorded personal education plan within the last six months. And again, that performance has remained consistently high, not dropping below 93% for the last 12 months. With regards to health assessments, you heard from uh, Nikki and Kelly earlier. Um, our with regards to our performance, we measure how many children have had a health assessment within 12 months of children over the age of five and six months for children under the age of five as of the final day of each month. So within December, 90.8% of health checks are being conducted uh, within the last 12 months. And we did hear about the small cohort of young people who um, don't wish to take part in a health assessment and the attempts that we're making to engage those young people and make sure that the health needs are met. Again, that's another area of strong performance and has remained consistently high at over 90% for the last 12 months. Dental checks is certainly an area of ongoing scrutiny and improvements. 66% of children have had a dental check in the last 12 months. I think this is the area that's probably been most impacted on by um, COVID. This performance is slowly improving, but definitely requires um, ongoing improvements. I think that's the end of that presentation. I'm glad I've got through it without crashing or being kicked out. Um, so I am available for any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Paula. Um, see, Councillor Davison, you will have a question. It's not really a question, Chair, but it's just a statement. And with regards to dental checkups, I think it's a problem everywhere. And it not is. just with our children looked after. I think it's a big problem and they, they should really come first on our list. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, just a couple of comments that I'd like to make. One is that I'm really glad to see that the um, three or more placements number is coming down because that is quite worrying if children have to have three or more placements. Um, and also, I'd, I'm really, really pleased that the case loads are coming down because the case loads, if the case loads are coming down, the children are certainly going to get a better deal, if you like, um, because it gives the um, social workers just that little bit more time to to put themselves to whatever case load they're working on. So, yeah, thank you very much for, for that, Paula. Thank you. That's absolutely sorry, Chair. I was just going to make a comment about um, placement stability because we often count a placement move as, as something that's disruptive to the to the child. But actually, with the work that we're doing to secure permanence, a lot of the moves that children experience may be a, a better move. For example, they may be moving from a residential placement into foster care or from foster care home to a parent. So we are doing further work to try and understand of those placement moves, how many may be better placement moves that um, have better outcomes for the children and young people and how many uh, are kind of escalating and, and are disruptive to the child. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you, Paula. And maybe if you're going to report on that again, could you put a little bit of that detail in, please? Yeah, so that work is ongoing, Chair, in terms of making sure that we understand that. Thank but you. I can certainly keep you up to date. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Uh, the next item is any urgent business. I have none. So all that leaves me to do is say good night to everybody. Thank you very, very much for attending. And if there's anybody watching outside, please, if you think you could make a good foster parent, please get in touch with the council. The more foster parents we have, the better it is for our children. Thank you very much indeed. And I just wish you all a good night. <laughs>